Production and distribution of City Club Forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Cleveland State University, Robert Conrad, and the Payne Fund. Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Rick Maniloff, president of the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association. We are proud to partner with the City Club to present the annual Law Day Forum. This year, we are delighted to welcome James Foreman, Jr., Yale Law School professor and author of Locking Up Our Own, Crime and Punishment in Black America. Law Day 2017, which was celebrated nationwide on Monday, May 1, honored the 14th Amendment and the many ways it has reshaped American law and society. In promoting this theme, the American Bar Association declared that the 14th Amendment serves as the cornerstone of landmark civil rights legislation, the foundation of numerous federal court decisions protecting fundamental rights, and a source of inspiration for all those who advocate for equal justice under the law. That phrase, equal justice under the law, has long been discussed and debated. We define ourselves as a society in part by how we administer justice. So what does it say about us that the United States comprises just 5% of the world's population, but we house 25% of its prisoners, making us the country with the highest proportion of its population in the criminal justice system? And it's probably no surprise to any of you in this room that these inmates are disproportionately male and people of color. African Americans make up 13.6% of the U.S. population, but African American men make up 40.2% of all prison inmates. Despite the increasing presence of African American police officers, judges, and lawyers ascending the leadership ranks of the criminal justice system. This phenomenon of locking up our own is the subject of Mr. Foreman's recently published book, and we are honored to have him here to provide more context and a deeper understanding of race in our criminal justice system. Mr. Foreman is a graduate of Atlanta's Roosevelt High School, Brown University, and Yale Law School, where he battled but continually lost to classmate Rick Maniloff in Friday football games. <laughs> Thus abandoning his football career, he clerked for Judge William Norris of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and Justice Sandra Day O'Connor of the United States Supreme Court. After clerking, he was a public defender in Washington, D.C., where for six years he represented both juveniles and adults charged with crimes. During his time as a public defender, Mr. Foreman became frustrated with the lack of education and job training opportunities for his clients. So, in 1997, along with David Domenici, he started the Maya Angelou Public Charter School, an alternative school for school dropouts and youth who had previously been arrested. A decade later, in 2007, the school assumed operation of the Maya Angelou Academy inside DC's juvenile prison. Today, twice as many juveniles are attending school or working on a regular basis once they're released, with many scholars heading directly to college. Because of this, the Academy has been hailed by national experts as one of the best educational programs in a correctional setting. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland and the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association, I am pleased to welcome our 2017 Law Day speaker, Professor James Foreman, Jr. Now you know one rule of speaking is you're never supposed to go behind somebody that has a voice like Rick's. <laughs> but I'm gonna do my best. I wanna thank uh, Rick for that kind introduction and uh, Dan Malthrop and the folks from the City Club for inviting me. You know, when you get an invitation here, the email letter says, you know, you're invited to speak, and then before you can really get to the next line, they have a list of the people that have spoken before. <laughs> you know, many presidents and heroes of mine like Brian Stevenson, Ta-Nehisi Coates, 
Desmond Tutu, and it's just very, very intimidating. And then if you aren't intimidated enough, you arrive, and Dan says, I'm not sure if you know who's spoken here in the past, <laughs> but let me tell you who. So I don't know what to say about that, but I'm going to do my best to not make a fool out of myself. I want to thank uh, Mario Marino, who uh, is giving given you all these uh, the copies of these books as, as a gift. Uh, I want to thank him for the books. He couldn't be with us today, but I really want to thank him for his commitment to working with uh, the nation's most vulnerable youth. I met him many years ago, and his organization's support is one of the reasons why we were able to do the things that, that Rick talked about. Um, and I also want to uh, thank De Deb McCam and uh, her bookstore. They were really one of the reasons that I got this initial invitation, and, and so I hope that everybody will support her store, A Cultural Exchange. It's a Cleveland institution, and it deserves all of our support. Um, and I also want to acknowledge uh, Arthur Evancheck. He is uh, here with his students um, from Case Western Reserve University. These are all students from the city of Cleveland who are now at Case Western and who are doing amazing things. I had a chance to meet them before this lunch, and I hope everybody here gets a chance to, need to meet them because with your support and your connections and your mentoring uh, and your guidance, uh, these students are going to do uh, magnificent things. And I also want to thank Arthur because more than any other single person, he helped me write this book. We've been friends for almost 20 years now, and he's also an amazing editor. So he debated every idea with me. He read every line. He critiqued every line. He rewrote more lines than I would like to admit. <laughs> And together, we produce the book that, that y'all have in front of you. So let me talk about why I decided to write this book. I'm somebody who I can be a little bit annoying to my friends because when we go to a movie, and if there are no African-American characters in the movie, when the movie's over and people say, well, what did you think of the movie? I say, well, it was all right, but where were the black characters? And I feel that way about not just movies, but also art, literature, history, law. And so I knew that I always wanted to write, as my first book, I wanted to write a book that had African American characters front and central in the narrative, in leadership positions. But it wasn't just that. There's also a reason that's more directly connected to the criminal justice system. You see, this is a book of history, a book of arguments, and a book of stories. And one of those stories is of a young man named Brandon. I open the book with this story. Brandon is a teenager in D.C. Superior Court, and he's charged with and has pled guilty to possession of a gun and possession of small amounts of marijuana. I'm his public defender. I've been assigned to represent him. And I had taken the job because I viewed that work as the civil rights work of my generation. My parents met in SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, my dad was the executive secretary. And I had opportunities available to me, and you heard some of them from Rick, clerking on the Supreme Court, all of that, that were unknown to my father's generation. And yet and still, it was also clear to me, we didn't have the term mass incarceration in the 1990s. That hadn't come to pass. But we, I did know that one in three young African-American men was under criminal justice supervision. And we didn't have the statistics for women, but every indication from my practice suggested that was too high as well. I did know that the United States had passed Russia and South Africa to become the world's largest jailer. So I'm in court. I'm representing Brandon. I'm asking for him to be released to go home, to go home to his mother and his grandmother who were there in court for him. I had letters from teacher, teachers, counselors, attesting to his character. Brandon... He's African-American, as were most of my clients. The prosecutor in the case, also African-American, was asking for him to be locked up. She wanted him to go to Oak Hill, the juvenile jail in the city, it, which was a dungeon. No functioning school. We've since made a lot of improvements, but at the time, no functioning school. Violence and drugs rampant. Not a place that you would want to send your worst enemy. Certainly not a place that you would want to send somebody who... This, the law says you're supposed to provide care and rehabilitation of. 
So she's asking him for him to go to Oak Hill, and the judge has to make the decision, Judge Curtis Walker, I changed the names of the characters to protect their privacy. Judge Walker is also African American. He leans back and he looks at this courtroom full, two African American lawyers, African American defendant, and he looks at us and he says, Brandon, Mr. Foreman has been telling me that you've had a hard life and you deserve a second chance. Well, son, let me tell you about hard. Let me tell you about Jim Crow and segregation. The judge had grown up in those times and he proceeded to tell Brandon about what that was like. And then he said, people marched and fought and died for you to be free. Martin Luther King died for you, son. And I tell you this, he didn't die for you to be running and gunning and thugging and carrying on and embarrassing your community and embarrassing your family. No, he did not. So I hope Mr. Foreman is right. I hope you turn it around. But right now, actions have consequences. And your consequence is Oak Hill. And he locked him up. And ever since that day, I thought about the fact that the city council that passed the laws that Brandon was sentenced under in DC was a majority African American city council. The police force was majority African American. And it occurred to me that Judge Walker wasn't alone. And there was a complicated story that nobody had told yet. A story that needed to be told with empathy and with compassion and with understanding for the pressures that people were under. But there was a story that needed to be told about how a generation of elected officials and law enforcement officials came to buy into some of the same mentality that was dominating the country over the last 40 or 50 years. So that was the, that's the story that I wanted to tell, and that's the book that I wanted to write. Why did this community come to lock up so many of its own? Now, that's the question. And the answer, we could pause now and everyone could read 239 pages, but y'all came here for a lunch talk, and so you want some of the highlights, and I, I understand that. So let me give you some of the highlights of the argument, and I hope that later you'll be able to go and look at it in, in more depth. But the first thing to understand is the rising crime and violence and drug addiction that was tearing through the African American community first in the 1960s, early 1970s, and then again in the crack years. We remember the crack years, some of us, but not as many of us remember that heroin was the first crack in 1960s, 1970s. It devastated black America. In Washington, D.C., they tested everybody who entered D.C. jail. In the early 1960s, 3% of the people entering the jail tested positive for heroin. By 1968, it was 45%. That's an epidemic. And these are the numbers from DC, but I have numbers from the book and from other cities, including Chicago, Atlanta, Cleveland. The homicide rate tripled in Washington, DC. It doubled in the 1960s in many cities, including this one. But it wasn't just the numbers, right? It's also the pain and the anguish that those numbers produce in a community. One of the things that I did is I went back and I found the archives of people who had been on the city council and now had stepped down and had donated their papers to various different libraries. And when you go back and read the archives, the pain just jumps off the pages. The letters from constituents to their council members saying, I don't recognize my city. We just fought a civil rights movement but I don't recognize my city. I feel like I'm a prisoner in my own home. I feel like I'm a stranger on my own streets. I can't go outside because they're selling drugs. I can't go outside. My kid can't go play because they might get shot. Now, who is receiving this material? Who's receiving these letters from constituents? This gets to the second big argument in my book. Because the people that are reading these letters in the 1970s are the first generation 
of African-American elected officials to come into power after the decline of formal Jim Crow, right? Stokes in Cleveland, Bradley in Los Angeles, Washington in Was- in Wa- Walter Washington in Washington, D.C., and city council members and police officers and prosecutors as well. This is a group of people Many of them were in the civil rights movement. Some of them were in SNCC with my parents. Some of them were from the South. All of them remember the centuries of under enforcement and under protection of the law, the denial of the equal protection of law in black communities. They remember when you didn't call the police if there was a crime in a black neighborhood, there was a robbery, if there was a a fight, if there was an assault, because the police weren't going to come. And if they did, they just were going to make matters worse. They remember when Southern sheriffs in cahoots with the Klan, it wasn't murder when a black person died. That was just another dead black person, and they did not use the word black person. So they remember that, and they are bound and determined to make black lives matter. Chapter two of the book, set in the 1970s, is called Black Lives Matter. They didn't use that term, but I titled the chapter that because I want to communicate to a modern day reader the commitment that this generation had to protecting black lives. And they viewed it like the judge did in my initial story as a civil rights issue. They view protection of black lives as a civil rights challenge. And so, There's a lot of things that I hope that people will take away from this book. But if there is one thing that I hope you will use this book for, if for no other, is that the next time somebody says to you and repeats the lie that black Americans only care about crime and violence when it's police officers doing it and don't care and we don't care about crime in our communities, we don't care about so-called black-on-black crime, Please hand them my book, because it is a 239-page rebuttal of that lie. Okay, so you have this new group of officials. They want to protect black lives, but why this way? Why through police and prosecution and prisons? And that gets to the third big argument of the book, which is that I said I wanted to write a book about black characters, right, and black actors and black leaders. But it's also true that any story of African American leadership, any story of African American agency is also a story about the limitations and the constraints on that agency. So this is a group of elected officials that they're not operating in a vacuum. They're protecting communities that have been disenfranchised, that have been stripped of jobs, that lack good schools, their job is to protect communities that because of the history of racism in this country don't have the same opportunities that the rest of America has. And not just that, not just that, but this group of leaders can't even get everything that they want in response to crime. So one of my main arguments in the book is that the black leadership class and black citizens as well have had what I call an all of the above strategy to fight crime. That is to say they've wanted police and prosecution, yes, but also jobs and also schools and also a fight against racism and also an end to segregation and also mental health programs and drug treatment programs and also parks and recreations that are that, that, that work, departments that work. They wanted all those things in response to crime, but what they got because of a broader America that wasn't prepared to hear their claims, what they got was law enforcement. So they wanted all of the above, and they got one of the above. All right, let me turn, those are the 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 arguments of the book in in broad strokes, but let me turn now to a couple questions that I get um, in response, um, and then uh, conclude with some thoughts about what we can do going forward. So one question that I sometimes get um, about this topic is, when I'm writing about African-American actors, then am I doing that in a way with the intention 
of letting white people off the hook. And let me say to that, absolutely not. I have a body of work where I've written about the way racism has, has affected and impacted and structured our criminal justice system and our society. And there are other people, people like Brian Stevenson, who I know you had here, who's a, you know, with his amazing book, Just Mercy. ta Coates, who you had here, with his amazing book, Between the World and Me. Michelle Alexander, The New Jim Crow, right, the Bible of this, on this topic. These writers have, in a deep and powerful and very, I think now, kind of public way, have made the case of how racism has affected every aspect of American society, and in particular, our criminal justice system. And I think that's right. But it's not the whole story. And so my book, I view as complementing and supplementing and sitting alongside those works to flesh out the rest of the story of how we got here. The second question I, that sometimes comes up that I want to kind of elevate is, and I've, I thought about this question a lot as I was writing, shouldn't the people that I'm writing about, these African-American leaders and law enforcement officials, prosecutors, judges, shouldn't they have known? Shouldn't they have known of the ways in which they were contributing? You know, we sit here now with our knowledge about 2.2 million people in, in prison and 7 million people under criminal justice supervision. And I guess I want to say to that, yes, to an extent, but mostly I would say no, or at least they didn't know everything that we know now, and, and in a lot of ways they couldn't have. So let me give you one example um, from the book. In one of the first issues that this majority black legislature in D.C. takes up is whether to decriminalize marijuana. Now think about now what we know about what mar marijuana criminalization has done, the damage it's done to African-American communities and the war on drugs more generally has done. And so you would have thought maybe that a majority black council in 1975 would have gone all along with marijuana decriminalization. But they didn't. And the reasons that they didn't, I think, are interesting and important. They didn't not go along with it because they didn't care about the black community. These black legislators very much cared. But they had seen the impact that heroin had had in the 1960s. They were worried about marijuana as a gateway to that. And more than that, many of them said, look, even if it never gets to heroin, because of racism in America, our children don't have the same luxury. They don't have the same margin for error. They can't go and get high and still succeed in school because their schools are worse off. They can't, if they get addicted, we don't have money and resources in our community to put everybody into residential drug treatment program. So it was out of actual care and concern, even though I think ultimately my own view is it was a mistake, but it was out of care and concern that they adopted this posture. And not only that, I said, shouldn't they have known? But think about this. Here's how the debate kind of went down. People who supported marijuana decriminalization said, you know, the problem with criminalization is, is people, get, you know, people can get a record. And that could haunt them. And the other side said, well, it's not that big of a deal. If someone gets busted with a small amount of marijuana, the case gets dismissed. That was true in 1975. And then they said, and if they get arrested a second time, they all get probation. That was true in 1975. But it's not true anymore. And what they couldn't have known is that for the decades to follow, Congress would pass laws saying, if you have an arrest record, even for a, a drug crime, it's going to be harder to get into public housing. It's going to be harder to get student loans. It's going to be harder to get a job. And here's what they really could not have known. They couldn't have known of a technological revolution such that an employer today can, with a press of a button, pull up your rec arrest record for decades. I, somebody wrote me yesterday, he was trying to get a job, and the employer pulled up an arrest for uh, a drug conviction in 1970 in Washington, D.C., came up, and he wanted to know what he could do about it. 
So they couldn't have predicted that technology will allow these records to follow people and do the lifetime damage that they do today. So let me talk for the last couple of minutes about what we can do about this now. So one of my arguments, as you probably have picked up when you think about kind of the marijuana decriminalization story, one of my arguments is that the way this system was built was with a series of small steps by many different actors across the country, 50, state, 50 states in the District of Columbia and the federal government, 3,000 counties, police officers, prosecutors, judges, legislators, probation and parole officers. If everybody gets a little bit tougher in their individual domain, a little bit less caring, a little bit less sympathetic, a little bit more likely to lock people up. If everybody does that, and we do it over 50 states and 3,000 counties in over 40 years, we get the system that we have now. We never had an up or down vote in this country. There was never a moment, certainly in the black communities, but even nationally, where somebody said, hey, mass incarceration, yes or no? Want to be the world's largest jailer? Want to lock up more people than Stalin's Russia? Yes or no? I suspect if the question had been asked, and I know if it had been asked in black communities, that the answer to that question would have been no. But that's not how it got phrased because that's not how the system got built. So then what does that mean for us today? It means we're going to have to unwind the system in the same step-by-step -step way through small micro acts for which all of us are responsible. And we're going to have to do it together. So let me give you a few kind of examples of things that can be done. In the criminal justice arena directly, if you care about this issue, the most important thing you can do is make sure that in your community you have a prosecutor, you elect a prosecutor who is progressive, who cares about these issues. That happened last November. I'm not gonna to speak to the Cleveland election because I know there's differences of opinion about that. But I will say nationally, for the first time in my lifetime, a slew, a slate of progressive prosecutors nationally got elected. They were elected on claims that we lock up too many people, the war on drugs has gone too far, wrongful convictions are a problem. This happened in Florida, it happened in Alabama, it happened in Texas, it happened in Denver, it happened in Chicago. Local prosecutors have more power over the criminal justice system than any actor, including even the president. So if you care about this issue, figure out what your local pro where the stance that your local prosecutor is taking. I just got to give you one more example of somebody who won that never in my lifetime would have thought would have ever won. In Texas, a former defense attorney with the words not guilty tattooed across his chest ran for prosecutor and won. So we can win these local elections and elect progressive prosecutors who will make a difference. If that guy won in Texas, anybody can win. <laughs> but it's not just within the criminal justice domain, right? We also have to think about what we can do as individual citizens. So almost everybody here is either an employee or an employer. I talked about how hard it is to get a job when you come out of prison or come out of jail even. We can change that. Recently, the Ford Foundation, which does amazing work on criminal justice reform, they visited a prison in New York State. And they presented their work. And at the end of the presentation, one of the guys who was a lot, a prisoner a lot, raised his hand and said, uh, excuse me, I'm just curious, when I get out, could I get hired at the Ford Foundation? <laughs> there was silence. But here, to their credit, and we could all follow this model, they went back, led by Darren Walker, their CEO, and they looked at their HR policies, which in fact made it almost impossible for this person to get hired, to even be considered. They got rid of those exclusions. And more than that, they built an internship program where they specifically go out and recruit and try to bring people in, first as interns and ultimately into paid positions, who have been in the criminal justice system. All of us, all of us could do that as employers. As universities, some, you know, I work at a university, so it's personal to me, some universities exclude people 
right off the bat. Others do consider this question of whether you have a record, but they do it much later in the process, not in your initial application, and after they've learned a lot more about you. So it becomes one thing that the university knows about you, not the only thing, and you don't signal to the applicant up front, you might as well not even fill this paper out because you're wasting your time because if you have a record, you're not going to get accepted. Churches, religious institutions. We have 900,000 people returning from prison and jails nationally every year. We have over 300,000 religious institutions, churches, synagogues, mosques, temples in this country. That means if each of our religious institutions adopted three people coming back to our community and said, we're going to help you network, we're going to help you reestablish, we're going to help you get housing, we're going to help you get an ID. When you come out of prison, you can't get anything without an ID in this country. People don't have IDs, not valid ones. They don't take the prison ID. People say, well, it only costs $20. Well, if you don't have any money, $20 is a million dollars. You don't have it. So what if you took three people through your church who were coming back to your community and said, we are going to be a source of support for you? And one last idea, and this one's kind of personal to me because I was giving these talks and thinking about, well, what could you do? And then I started also to take this upon myself and say, well, what, what do I do? And I teach at this law school, and I love it, but am I doing enough? So recently I got trained by a program called Inside Out, which trains professors. Anybody here who is a professor or associated with the university can get trained in this program, and your area doesn't have to be criminal justice. They do it in every topic. They train you on how to teach the class that you already teach at your university in a prison. So last year, I took 10 Yale Law students into a Connecticut State prison to study in a seminar setting along with 10 incarcerated men. We studied the same material that we normally study at Yale. Now we studied it in the prison setting as a group of 20, as equals. Most meaningful teach teaching I ever did I don't encourage you to do it for self-interested reasons, but it is true that my evaluations were the best I've ever gotten. <laughs> but not just that, one of the students who was incarcerated wrote this letter. He said, I appreciated the law that you taught me, but actually the most meaningful thing was that for two hours, I sat around a table and people treated me as an intellectual. They treated me as somebody who had ideas and that's never happened to me in my life. Somebody else wrote, for two hours a week, I felt like I wasn't in prison. So there's not going to be a silver bullet. There's not going to be a single piece of legislation. There's not going to be a single executive order that is going to solve this problem. But if we, in our own spheres of influence, in the own domain, our own domains that we control, if we decide individually and then as a collective that we are going to work for a criminal justice system that's more humane, that's more merciful, that's more fair, that's more compassionate. That would mean that I could come back and there'll be a companion volume to this book. <laughs> and it'll be the story of the generation that defeated mass incarceration. Thank you. Today, we are enjoying our annual Law Day Forum with James Foreman, Jr., professor of law at Yale Law School and author of Locking Up Our Own, Crime and Punishment in Black America. We're about to begin the audience Q&A. We welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, uh, or those of you joining us via our radio broadcast, webcast, or live simulcast at the Parma Snow Branch of the Cuyahoga County Public Library. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will try to work it into the program. We want to remind you that your questions should be brief and to the point. Holding the microphones today are content coordinator Teddy Eisenberg and director of programming Stephanie Jansky. May we have the first question, please? Good afternoon, James. Uh, thank you for coming. Appreciate it. My name's Ian Friedman, and I'm a criminal defense lawyer here in town. Great. Thank you. 
One of the problems that I see now, and I think it's getting worse, mm. particularly after the election as the stock prices rose, uh, for the private prisons, yeah. you know, the CCAs uh, of America, the state prisons, and so forth. Locally, we don't have the resources to always deal with uh, those that we have to within the rehabilitation system. I guess my question to you is, how much of a problem do you see uh, with the private um, uh, prison system, private jailing, and even if we look at the juveniles, the, the private rehabilitation centers, because all of these places are yeah. making the contributions to the legislators that are making these laws. And so we're going to give the legislators money we want these people coming to us so that our stocks continue. So I'd like to know your opinion on that. And thank you again for coming. Thank you, and thank you for your, the work that you're doing. Um, this is, uh, as, a, as a criminal defense lawyer, I have a special you know, connection to you. I was, I was doing a presentation about this book uh, in Baltimore, and a uh, uh, federal judge, uh, Andre Davis, uh, said, you know, one of the things I liked about this book is that, that you are hard on everybody, but you're fair to everybody. And when he said that, I realized that it wasn't entirely true because there's one group of people who I'm not hard at, hard on at all, and that is public defenders. So it's like a love letter to criminal defense lawyers. <laughs> so if you know anybody who's a criminal defense lawyer, you can give them, give them the book. But uh, I think that the problem that you're describing is a deep and it's a profound one. And it goes beyond pri private privatization, but it's, it, it, it is most devastating in the realm you've described. So the fundamental problem is that we now have interests, right? We have vested interests in keeping our prison system large and growing. So in some states where they've you know, New York State has done a really good job of reducing their, their prison population over the last decade. But because of the work of the corrections unions, they can't close any of the facilities. So they have, these faci they have facilities in New York that are sitting open with nobody in them. And that's terrible for taxpayers, but it's also terrible because you know as long as they're there, that there's going to be a motivation to try to start filling them. So it's not just a privatization problem, right? In California, the public union corrections officers have been very powerful in opposing criminal justice reform and in earlier years fighting for longer sentences. So it's a vested interest problem. Having said that, you're right that but the privatization makes it worse. And I don't even really know how to respond to questions about private prisons really because of all the things that we do, it's the one where it seems most unjustified to me just as a concept. Like, so here's my pitch to you. We are housing people who are our nation's most vulnerable citizens who have very little contact with the outside world, who many of whom have mental health issues and addiction issues, and we're responsible as a society to caring for them. We're incarcerating them, we're keeping them away from the rest of the public. That's the system that we have. I would say incarcerate fewer for not as long, but that's the system that we have. And so here's my proposal. We're going to set up a structure where the operators have every incentive to make their life more and more miserable. If you don't give the people in your care enough food, you make a profit. If you don't hire enough guards so then there's violence, you make a profit. If you stuff multiple people into one cell, you make a profit. So the whole notion, and that, by the way, what I just told you, that's not like the left critique. That's the business model. That's in the corporate documents. So there's nothing to say about it in my mind except it's abysmal. I'm somewhat critical in the book of some things, President Obama in the epilogue for not going far enough on some issues. But one thing that I give the administration a lot of credit for is President Obama and Eric Holder 
worked very hard to try to reduce our reliance on private prisons in the federal system, the area they could control. They don't have, they have very little to do with what the state of Ohio chooses to do. Um, and one of the terrible things that's happening now in the federal system is that President Trump and Jeff Sessions are trying to reintroduce more privatization. Hi, I am a Kurt Caracol. I run the Third Federal Foundation, but I'm also a lawyer. Thank you for a great presentation. Uh, I read a study last year that said that 70% of our prisoners read at a fourth grade level or less. So I just wondered what um, the literacy levels have to do with locking these people up. Well, they have a lot to do with it. So when we talk about our prison system, you know, sometimes we speak in kind of broad strokes and talk about the prison system as one that's kind of affecting African Americans broadly, that, our community. But the truth is it's a, it's a crisis that is by far hits hardest on the poorest and the least educated members of our community. So just to give you one statistic on this point, um, from the 1960s onward, the lifetime risk of incarceration for African Americans went up sevenfold. But the lifetime risk of incarceration for African Americans who had attended college didn't increase at all. Right now, if you drop out of school you're at, and you're African American, you drop out of high school, you're 10 times more likely to go to prison in your lifetime than somebody who has a, an African American who's attended college. So the, there's a class and an educational dimension. And this is true, by the way. The numbers I just gave you are about African Americans where the crisis is most severe. But one of the things we also need to talk more in this country is the criminal justice crisis that's affecting all Americans, including white Americans, who are also, it is the poor and the uneducated members of that community who, I mean, you can go to jails in certain states and almost everybody in the jail is white. But what they are is poor. And what they are is uneducated. And so, so yes, uh, the, the numbers, I don't know that particular statistic, but it sounds broadly like, you know, that it would be correct. Um, one of the reasons why, um, this isn't the only answer, but again, one of my arguments is right, is everybody has to pick up a piece where you are and fight that battle and collectively will overcome. One of the reasons we do the work inside the juvenile facility in Wash is in, in that facility, the kids are anywhere between typically kind of fourth and sixth grade reading level uh, when they arrive. Um, and, but what we've seen is that if you run a high quality program of which there are very few in part because of privatization, but if you run a high quality program in a juvenile, I mean, the one thing is the kids are in school, like they're there. So we don't have attendance problems. And if you make, <laughs> if you make the program excellent, Right then, it's to me. Then it's like a triple obligation to make the program excellent. Like they don't have a, you don't have a choice. So we darn sure better make sure that school is great. We're making you go, and we've seen uh, students increase over a nine-month period. They'll typically they increase 1.5 grade levels in reading and in math. And these are students who historically have, have progressed at about a half a grade level for every year they've been in school, right? That's why they're 15 in the fourth or fifth grade level. So it's like triple their traditional rate of gain. So it can be done, um, but we have to put the resources into it and we have to bring caring, committed, loving teachers, give them a quality curriculum, and then fund it at the levels that it needs to be funded. That's, that's the challenge. Hi, uh, Hi, my name is Adora Schmiedel, and I'm with an organization called Towards Employment. And um, one mm. of our employees couldn't be here today, and so she gave me a question to ask you. Um, she's a trainer, Ms. Stella Shepard, and if you know her, you would know I, I have to ask this question or she will tackle me when I go home. Um, she's a trainer, and she, is, uh, she trains folks who are uh, she runs job readiness classes for folks who are reentering and uh, prepares them for work. And she said that um, she feels that when she, um, and, and she's a graduate of the Cleveland school system, and she says as a community, are we habituating our kindergartners 
to be ready for prison. Because when she goes to schools, she doesn't see elementary schools that look like schools. They look like mini prisons. And she's there with parents who are graduates, quote unquote, of prisons, who are sending their children to prisons. She said she thinks you handle tough subjects and she's a tough lady, so she likes some answers. <laughs> Well, I don't know the particular, you know, schools that she's refer, you know, referring to, um, but um, I've certainly, I know that there are places that are both, that, that might fit that um, category, both because they, either because they have really strict discipline policies, and so there's this real kind of zero tolerance. Um, you know, there's a report that came out, there was a report that came out about racial disparities in suspension and expulsion rates for kindergartners. And before I read further, I was like, for what, what? like, <laughs> who even had an idea to do this study? Who, like, is it true, you know, and yes, it's true, and yes, it, and yes, there are race and class disparities, and in particular, special education status disparities, and who gets treated in that way. Uh, there's also a dynamic of schools that maybe it's a little different from zero tolerance, but have an incredibly rigid set of rules, and their structure um, is, you know, th they think that that's what needs to be done to prepare kids for, you know, who are from low-income backgrounds for higher for for life. And my bias against those places is, is that I basically feel like. Like my basic organizing principle is that for the most part, there'll be some exceptions to this, but for the most part, like whatever rich people get and do, that's what I want everybody be, to be able to get and do. <laughs> and when I walk into like schools that are serving up, you know, pre preschools that are serving upper middle class families, they're like joyous and playful. Everybody's fighting for who's more play-based than the one before. And so, you know, I understand the argument that, well, you know, if kids come and they haven't had the same exposure to books and such in the early years, then you might have, have to have some additional focus on, you know, literacy because you can't require, you can't assume that that's come from the home. I get that point. I think that's real. But to me, you build that into a basic structure that is a structure of, joy, of play, of loving, of carefree, of what all of us, like nobody looks back and is like, yeah, I remember when like the teacher was wrapping my hand with the ruler to make me like look at the reader when I was in first grade. Like that's not anyone's memory of what it means to learn to love learning. So I don't know the details, but, but I basically agree with the questioner who was not present. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, I think the topic of your, your subject matter is is, is timely and, mm. and crucial. I'm, I'm just curious to know um, your thoughts on, you know, how much of your argument of why we lock up our own, back to that, uh, has to do with class distinctions. Yeah. So that's a. There's a lot about. There's a, a lot about class in the book. I'm glad you ask that question, you know, I only get kind of 30 minutes up front, but, and nobody wants to, would want to listen to one hour lecture, but if there were an hour, then that would be certainly one of the arguments that I would have kind of highlighted in my opening presentation. I think class works its way throughout. So one of the things I just mentioned, right, was the likelihood of prison going based on your, econ or your educational background, which we know correlates to economic background. And so, you know, we have this concept, there's a concept in political science of kind of linked fate, the notion that, you know, what, that in, in communities of color, in any subordinate group, but especially in African Americans, given our history, that we have a connection to one another. So when I see something happening to another African American, my, and even if I'm in another state across the country, there's some amount of empathy and I'm like, you know, that could be me. And, or that could be a family member. And that's true. Political sciences, scientists have, have documented this, and I think we all, you know, we all feel it. Um, but there are also topics that kind of press on that and, and, and press to separate and divide us. And I think crime and, and punishment is one of those things um, because 
Be because, because of racism, because of wealth inequalities, because of redlining, because of patterns of segregation, African American members of the middle class live closer to, typically, the black poor than would a member of the white middle class. And as a result, they are more likely to be, for example, a subject of burglary, you know, a victim of a burglary. And so no one wants their home broken into. And, uh, and so there's this kind of a sense of anger that can develop. I don't know that it was class necessarily that was coming from the judge in that initial speech, but there certainly was an element of, I made it against harder odds. You need to as well. And here's the thing about that. I, you know, when we talk a lot about personal responsibility, like the judge's argument was kind of a personal responsibility argument. And I'm all for the personal responsibility lecture. I give the lecture, I have an eight-year-old son. I give it to him all the time. <laughs> and there's stuff that he can't do. And he's like, yeah, but Billy, no, I'm, you're not Billy. <laughs> you know, and your hair is going to look correct. Because I, don't, I know you're going to be judged unfairly already. So I'm not piling on other stuff. You can't misbehave. They're already going to be treated, assuming you want to misbehave. But that's the home or the church or the barbershop. That's where we need to have those conversations. But in public policy, in legislatures, in courts, for that judge who is giving that lecture, to me, that's not the place for that. To me, that's the place where we talk about how do we structure policies so that our children can thrive? How do we make it more? Because there's a... People, uh, people exercise personal responsibility in a context, right? If you grow up in a community where the schools are excellent and everybody's going off to a job and the public transportation gets you to where you need to go quickly and there's not a highway that's been built through the middle of your neighborhood, you are more likely to do the things you need to do to succeed in school. So what I'm saying is that We've gotten, I think, a little bit bamboozled by this personal responsibility thing. We've taken it from the private realm, and we brought it into the policy realm where it doesn't belong. I wonder about, are there role models in this country where certain parts of the country do much better than other parts, and are there other democracies that do much better than we? And one thing I'm thinking of, we send these kids who have served their time back to the same environment. Wouldn't it make sense to have like a community organization, instead of going to the home where the parents are not skilled parents, to have, have an option of going to, like in Israel they have a kibbutz where, they, where they, the parents could visit it in the evening but they would be raised by skilled social workers during the day. Does that make any sense? Reluctant to go down the road of taking kids out of their families uh, too quickly because I do think that all of the kind of racial disparities and prejudices that we see in the rest of society have the potential to reenact themselves there. Um, and I would not want, um, I would not want African American children, I, my fear would be that poor children of all races and African American and Latino children in particular would be more likely to have their, be taken out of their homes because social workers would have judged them not fit. But I do think we have to build up, I do agree with your point that other societies are more tolerant, and I think that we have to build up a more robust structure of supports and second chance opportunities. Today at the City Club, we have been enjoying our annual Law Day Forum with James Foreman, Jr., professor of law at Yale Law School, the author of Locking Up Our Own, Crime and Punishment in Black America. Today's forum is the Sidney D. Joseph's Memorial Forum on the Bill of Rights, made possible by a generous gift from Nina Josephs. We appreciate your generosity and continued support of the City Club. Mr. Foreman, 
also appears as part of the City Club's Authors in Conversation series, supported in part by the residents of Cuyahoga County through a public grant from Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. We appreciate your support. This Law Day Forum is presented as part of Stokes Honoring the Past, Inspiring the Future series. The City Club of Cleveland is proud to be a partner in the year-long community-wide commemoration of the 50th anniversary of Carl Stokes' election as Mayor of Cleveland. Mayor Stokes and his brother, Congressman Louis Stokes, played key roles in the advancement of the city and the nation through the civil rights movement and beyond. Our annual Law Day Forum is presented in collaboration with the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association. Lastly, we welcome students from Flow Home School Co-op and Westlake High School. Student participation in City Club forums is provided by many foundations, including the William E. Weiss Foundation. We thank you all for being here today. Complimentary copies of Mr. Foreman's book, Locking Up Our Own, Crime and Punishment in Black America, is provided by Marino Ventures. And that brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you, Professor Foreman. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Cleveland State University, Robert Conrad, and the Payne Fund.